Hi, everyone. Welcome to the International Intersectional Advocacy at the Polls panel. Um, today, we have two phenomenal women uh, joining us. We have uh, the awesome Blair Imani, as well as Kimberly Jones. Hey, ladies, how are you doing today? Good. I'm doing awesome. fabulous. Thank you. Good, good. Um, we're so happy to have you here with us, and I'm super excited to be moderating moderating today's panel. Um, so without further ado, um, you all are your biggest cheerleaders. You know, you're doing the work every day. So I'm going to have you all introduce yourself to the world. So let's start with you, Blair. Sure. So my name is Blair Imani. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I come from the intersecting identities of Blackness. I'm bisexual. I'm Muslim. I'm a woman. Um, I am an author and a historian. So you're going to have to limit my responses because I know as a historian, I could go into too much detail, but um, I'm really excited to be here and um, to be talking about um, the work that we're doing. Shout out my book. So my first book is called Modern Herstory, and my second book is called Making Our Way Home, The Great Migration and the Black American Dream, and they're available for purchase. <laughs> <laughs> you got to plug, you got to plug. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Um, and how about you, Kimberly? Um, my name is Kimberly Jones. I also use she her pronouns. Um, I'm an old, I identify as an old black lady. Um, and people always think that I'm like, I get all these invites for like millennials of today. And I'm like, Gen Xer. I know Gen X is very quiet and we've let millennials and boomers fight it out, but we exist. Um, <laughs> um, and, and so I am an author, filmmaker, community activist. Um, most people know me from my viral video, How Can We Win? Um, I also um, am a mom. Um, I have a 14-year-old brilliant boy who thinks that I'm stupid, which challenges me every day to educate myself. Um, some people call me the Black Storian, um, just because I've been studying our history since I was about nine or 10 years old when I was um, taking after-school classes down at the DuSable Museum in Chicago, where I grew up. And now I am an AT alien. And that's it in a nutshell. Oh, and I also have a book. Um, I, have, I write for young adults. So I have a YA no novel called I'm Not Dying with you tonight um and i have a second ya novel that'll be out next year um called um i will fly again and you can find anything kim at my website which is kimjoneswrites.com awesome congratulations to the both of you um and my name is courtney richardson i um, lead creative strategy at paper magazine um and i've been asked to moderate today and be in your presence so i'm super stoked so let's get into things so what prompted both of you to get into adv advocacy work, especially uh, voting in particular. Um, I, you know, I like I said, I grew up in Chicago, and you know, my I'm one of seven kids. I'm the baby of seven kids, and so when you have that many children, my parents had to always find activities to keep us busy, especially in Chicago, which I don't need to tell you what happened in Chicago so they wanted to keep us like focused and busy and so um, I went to after school programs at the DuSable Museum um, at the ETA but most importantly at Operation Push Rainbow Coalition which is where I spent a lot of time uh, in my formative years and of course being there you know they taught us the importance of voting not just voting but of, of lobbying of just how important the the judicial branch is and how voting has such a hardcore effect on that. And so that's always been something that was implanted in me at a very young age. Um, that was super important. I had a personal experience, um, you know, here in in Georgia, where I was one of the people who my vote got thrown out um, when Stacey Abrams was running against Kemp. And I'm part of the class action lawsuit that is suing him. And it as much, it's one thing, right, exactly. It's one thing to like know about voter um, suppression. It's a whole nother thing to experience it. Um, because even for those of us who fight against it in our minds, we're fighting for it for people who are elderly, for people who are financially disenfranchised. So for it to happen to me in the way that it did, it made me realize like how serious, severe, and consistent people are on trying to suppress votes. Yeah, it's 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 a shame. Um, and so for you to actually experience something like this, I'm sure it makes the work even. Um, you don't take it in vain. Mm -hmm. And Blair, um, what prompted you to get into advocacy work, especially voting? So it's it's interesting because so often, like just what you said, Kimberly, like it's not that we were like, hmm, 
today I'm going to fight for freedom. It's like, no, like you're constantly confronted with like dealing with nonsense and nonsense. I call it American nonsense, but it's like American white supremacy, um, American capitalism, colonization, imperialism, etc. Nonsense is faster, but I'm not just saying like fun and games. It's, it's serious. And so when it comes to talking about voting in particular, like, you know, of course I grew up with the kind of, uh, that story arc about like how voting how we fought for it so you know heavily the civil rights act voting rights act and how you know it's our sacred duty to vote and like you know in california a lot of folks vote by absentee absentee ballot and so i was very familiar with that but when i moved to go to school in louisiana i kind of had my like political orientation shifted not so much that i like shifted like my identities or my ideas it was that i was kind of like woken to the moment i had grown up in this you know post-racial bubble grew up fair skin with curly hair everyone you know corbin blue was popular being like mixed race was in so i had this kind of idea obama's president you know we were free it's everything's fine but you know that's a myth and when i moved to school in louisiana and i immediately started you know confronting my black identity in a way that was different from how I grew up um, because I had no delusions about my racial identity I had no confusion about being a black woman but when I got to the south and people were like hey light bright I was like what what is this what I knew what colorism was but as far as how like it impacted my uh, identity it was just such a a difference and so going back to voting like having things like a, a you know getting an absentee ballot. I just recall when um, Mary, Mary Landry was running for re-election and how folks had to drive back home to their individual parishes so that they could vote locally with the one that was, you know, because they were registered at home. They didn't, they weren't able to like re-register at LSU where I went to school. So that was something that was interesting. And then I also started to look at lobbying as well, like you were saying, Kimberly, because I realized that, you know, okay, well, I'm not a registered voter in Louisiana. How can I make change? And I was like, well, I can dress cute and I can talk well. So let me show up to the state capitol when I'm not in school and talk to these people about how they need to make laws that protect LGBTQ families. Because at that time, uh, I'm not sure of the case now, but you could get fired, you could get removed from your housing for being gay on this idea of like religious freedom. So when I converted to Islam and I started seeing how these same people who are talking about religious freedom was trying to infringe on like Islamic and Jewish um, ability to worship and black Christian ability to worship, it really started to kind of activate me in a way where I was thinking and still very much think that we can't just talk about voting in a vacuum, which I don't think we're here to do whatsoever, but it's about looking at the entire framework, breaking that down and making it work for us. Yes, absolutely, 100% agree with you. And, you know, sort of being a part of an overall marginalized community, it is tough, you know, Um, and you all are sort of standing on the front lines um, on behalf of so many people. And, you know, we're thankful for, you know, your social justice work and for speaking up and speaking out. But how do, how does um, marginalized communities, like how do they overcome the barriers that they face, you know, not only every day, but overall uh, when it comes to inequalities such as voter oppression or identity injustices? Well, I think first, the first thing that we have to recognize is we have to stop giving like a pass to white supremacy to sit back and be inactive in this process. Like um, racism is not a black issue that white people need to empathize with. It is their problem that they created that they need to fix. Um, so it's it's not my job to like absolve you of your, you know, supremacy in my DMs and tell you what it is that you need to do. Like, you got the same Google I got. You need to be figuring out how we got here and then working towards fixing it and creating plans that fix it. They are not unfamiliar with the atrocities that we are facing every day. They are not unfamiliar with redlining. They are not unfamiliar with the $23 billion that's spent annually more on educating white children than educating children of color. Um, These are not mysteries to people. But what has happened is people have become complacent and comfortable and comfortable in in holding on so heavily to their construct of whiteness and what and the privilege that that provides them is that they don't actually want to do the work because somehow, somehow I don't know that people in this country have decided, you know, they're like, they're like a bad romantic relationship and that, you know, they think because, you know, 
they're cheating, then you must also be cheating. It's like, no, you want to ravage, kill, and dominate over people. Black people are like the nerds of the universe. We have no desire for that. We just want to be given the justice that is deserved. And mostly what we really want for people is for people to stay out of our way and allow us to thrive in a way that we're capable of doing if we're not faced with things like voter suppression, if we're not faced like by being over-policed, if we're not faced by redlining, if we're not faced, faced by, uh, you know, uh, poor education and making a percentage of what our white counterparts make when we have the same education. Um, so at the end of the day, there is a lot of work to be done in our community, but a lot of the work has to be done outside of our community. A lot of the work is not our responsibility because we are not the people who are actively engaging and keeping this oppression going. It is the oppressor that is now responsible to take their proverbial foot off of our neck. Absolutely. We didn't invent the constructs that they placed upon us hundreds, and hundreds of years ago. Mm -hmm. What do you think? And I've, been, I've been talking about um, white paternalism a lot recently and how, well, not recently, but like specifically recently, I did um, an Instagram post about it. And I have so many folks who are like, like uh, you're saying, Kimberly, trying to absolve themselves of their sins through my DMs. And then people, when I was like shutting down my DMs, and then I started getting alms in the form of Venmo transactions where people were like trying to message me on that platform. And I was like, nah, but I'm, I'm like, I'll take it. But anyway, like it, it's really interesting. But when you start talking about white paternalism and this idea that white people have a duty to intervene in the lives of black, indigenous, and or people of color, BIPOC, then it starts to fit in together. And I was trying to make this very clear example to people that when we are more focused on moving the 10% of black folks who have expressed interest through polling and uh, voting for Trump instead of the 40 plus percent, 46 plus percent of white people that are interested in voting for Trump. That's the problem. When we're more interested, and not we, but when white folks are more interested in talking to a black person that they have no business talking to or interacting with or meeting with or knowing, instead of talking to their mother and their cousin and their uncle and themselves, that's a problem. And so those are really the things that have to be conflated. But white paternalism is the reason that black people are not left alone. I remember like the first time I was like a young kid, the first time I heard about the idea that like black people don't have to interact with police. It was just such like a mind boggling moment for me. Cause I was like, yeah, like why is this something that I've accepted? And that's because of white supremacy and this idea that we have to be watched, that we have to be monitored, that the war on drugs was good for us, that enslavement was good for us, that, you know, we can't, direct our own lives and it is so harmful and truly it can be found in all these different ways and the reason why I'm more intent on using the terms white paternalism is because it is the confluence of white supremacy and paternalism and how that interacts with patriarchy and race and gender etc and when instead of white saviorism which still sounds like it's somewhat of a good thing because you have the word savior in there you're not saving anyone it's white detrimentalism if anything it's the the process where we are constantly prevented from directing our own futures instead of looking at the case studies of how many times it hasn't worked when y'all tried to be in charge. So that's what we have to reckon with. It's not so much that it's hard to be black in America. It's that it's hard to be black in an anti-black state. Right. It's exhausting, right? Um, it's really white fragility that we're kind of fighting against up against as well. Um, so when should future voters start kind of learning about, you know, their voting rights. I'm sure we have a lot of young people who are watching um, who are underage um, or, you know, people who are of age but haven't started really kind of being active and getting into activism. Like, when is the right time to go ahead and sort of hit the ground running, if you will? I think that it's definitely not something that should start when you turn 18 and you register to vote. I also acknowledge, like, you know, I was the one of like I think five black kids at the school that I went to the high school I went to in San Marino and we had like a dedicated assembly on how to fill out like a, a ballot how to fill out a voter registration form we had voter registration forms available in the office we had resources to be able to do that work because we weren't you know we, we had that because this is like kind of a you know an economically wealthy and advantaged area there's an emphasis on, okay, now let's empower these folks because they are smart enough to make the decisions. You have a school right up the street, you know, South Pasadena High School, completely different dynamic where it's like, okay, well, you know, you have metal detectors coming into the classroom. Like there's just such a difference in the policing and the paternalism and how people are treated. And that goes goes all the way down to a teacher's ability to talk about voting because of course we have to monitor what's going into those kids' minds because they're different somehow and they're more criminalized and they're treated completely differently. 
But I just know that like growing up in this kind of like white school system with like wealthy white people and people of color as well, because there's a high Asian population, there was a complete difference in how we looked at like civic uh, civic duty, things like jury duty, things like uh, voting. Protest was not part of the conversation. Running for office was part of the conversation. So it's very much interesting how you learn about how to vote when you are coming from a position of power versus coming from a position of, um, you know, of disadvantage, of, of not having privilege or of oppression. Um, so I think that's the first thing is recognizing why some kids are taught and why some kids aren't. Like there was, you know, the youth in government program, the Young Republicans program, some of the most, uh, you know, fortified initiatives about voting were funded by the Republican, California Republican Party. So that's part of it too, because you have to look at the folks who are economically advantaged and then interested in upholding um, certain systems. So it's not so much to say that like there's some kid out there who's just not activated because nobody's talked to them about voting. What lay kids get to talk about voting, like, and when I say lay kids, I'm not saying kids that are less intelligent. I'm saying like your average kid that doesn't come from privilege the first voting conversation they're going to see is like an MTV commercial. I think speaking for our generation, like an MTV commercial that says vote or die. How is that more helpful than learning how to fill out a ballot or how to fill out a voter registration form? So it's intentional misinformation. It's an intentional uneducation that's happening that has to be fought against. Um, but I think a lot of times what we see on the Democratic side, on the liberal side, is this idea that kids don't vote because they're not in, they're not excited about it because they don't care and because they're not uh, confident enough. And it's like, these kids are plenty confident. These kids aren't given the tools and resources that they need. Like you can't Google something about voting if you don't even know that it exists to be able to search for. So that's something that I think needs to be tackled as well. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think the lobbying piece is like a really important piece that people don't talk about and don't teach people. Like. I found it really fascinating, Blair, that you're saying that, you know, the the, Repub the young Republicans were so active um, because those are the spaces in which people learn things like lobbying and the importance of it. People have this vision of lobbying that it's something that's done when you have like a a trillion dollars that you know that it's not indicative of just going down to city hall and standing up for yourself and being there at the meetings and and knowing that you want to participate in advocacy for a particular subject and, you know, galvanizing the people around you and getting petitions signed. And if, you know, there is some fundraising involved in it sometimes, but that it's something that the average person can do, can do. They think of it as something that they've like watched on Scandal where there's, you know, millions of dollars and people are running around in suits and, you know, sneaking in dark corners and having conversations with high powered people. And it's like, no, mostly what affects you is your, is your local legislation and you have the ability to have an effect on your local legislation and so um, there are a couple like guys that I follow online so I can't take credit for this but the, they have they make t-shirts that say um, um, poor that we tell poor people to vote and rich people to lobby um, and it's because we're not actually like active in our in our judicial system active in our in our legislator and the way in which people who have the income and more importantly than the income the education to do so. The other thing is, I think we need to start challenging some of the, the systemic norms, right? We, we rail against the systemic norms, but we're not picking those apart. We're just trying to work within the system. And it's at this point where we have to realize that we have to be disruptors and we have to dismantle some of those things. You're 18 years old and you can go off to war and be killed for this country, but you can't run for a city council seat. You can't be a comptroller. You can't be a county commissioner which makes no sense to me, you know what I mean? Because there are some young people who are very excited about about what they could do. And most of these jobs, see, most people don't even understand what's happening down there at City Hall. Most of these jobs, like commissioner jobs, they're part-time jobs. These are not full-time jobs. You could very well be a full-time student and a part-time commissioner. Mm -hmm. And so we have to start dismantling the system that does not allow um, you know, young people to get involved in an act way and view it as a career as opposed to this distant thing that has nothing to do with them. Absolutely. And so, I just want to, yeah. oh, just like add on to that a little bit. Like I totally like the whole lobbying versus voting. Like I definitely was groomed to be, to lobby. Like they taught us how to wear a suit. They taught us so many different things to this regional occupation program, which was um, part of the United States or part of the California um, state curriculum. And it was about how to create a resume and how really to 
you know, go over the head of hierarchy and climb this ladder. And that was, you know, so intimately connected to this idea of white entitlement and entitlement to the system. And I think there's a big difference in who has felt in historically, I'm not, I think, I know that there's a huge difference in who has felt historically entitled to taking advantage of a system and who has had felt that they need to work around it and work within it. But I think, yes, absolutely, like this idea that now we have to disrupt it is so absolutely essential at this moment that even when we look at who has historically had advantage and who has it, that the moment is absolutely right now to get beyond your own like limits of imagination on what the future can look like. And that's a process I'm constantly doing with myself. So outside of events like this, how can young people learn about or learn further about voter disenfranchisement? Um, you know, I can say here in my state, in Georgia, we have an amazing program called the New Georgia Project, um, which Stacey Abrams was one of the founders of the New Georgia Project. Um, and it's an app, right? So they are not only are they making it, um, are they doing the work, but they're also targeting young people and knowing like if they hand out a flyer or make a robocall or any of those kind of like, you know, dated modalities, they're not going to get to young people. So they created an app. Um, and so with that app, you can see like, who's running in your district. You can check information to make sure that you're on the voter roll, that if you've been purged from the voter roll, what you need to do to get back on that roll. A lot of people don't know in certain states, if you haven't voted in the past uh, two elections, you're purged and not illegally purged. You're legally purged from the voter roll if you haven't uh, voted in two federal elections in a row. So a lot of times that's what happened um, with recently with the, the last presidential election is people were disenfranchised and hadn't voted in a while and they felt like, okay, this time I'm going to go do it and then went and realized they had been purged because they hadn't voted for two federal terms. Um, and so the app gives you a lot of information um, about that and how to find that information. And I've been told that there are comparable apps and programs and systems in other states um, that people can look look up to. But we're also going to have to get back to like so, some old school techniques that work, right? We're going to have to like start setting up tables and throwing a tablecloth on in front of it in places and spaces where we know that young people are and just like hardcore giving people the information. But we're also going to have to make it concise um, because this is, you know, outside of living in this current dystopian novel that we're living in, for the most part, people have very bu busy schedules and they don't have 30 minutes to give to you at your table, which is why people don't stop at those tables because they don't want to hear a, a full manifesto on what it is that you're trying to get done. But if we can come up with like concise ways to deliver that message, um, you know, quick postcards that we could even just say to people, hey, if I could just have one minute of your time and the rest of the information you're going to need is going to be on this postcard that I'm going to put in your hand. And if that's not enough, there's a link to the app that you can download from, you know, your Apple Store, Play Store on the postcard. Like we're really going to have to get concise and consistent about how we're disseminating information so that people can get it in one place. And it's clear and it's in lay mm -hmm. terms, because, again, like Blair was saying, everyone doesn't have access to this information for you to have like some convoluted over you know over thought out uh, declaration on what you need to do and how you need to do it and even though we are like well I, I shouldn't have to just tell, tell people what to do and where to do well you know right now we're talking about productivity and so yeah you need to tell people what to do and where to do it great absolutely um, yeah in the past I've worked at as like civic action lead at all these different like well a few different startups, not a bunch, but a few different startups that were trying to look at like voter education and specifically like youth activation. And there was so much more resources and time spent asking why don't kids do this or like how can we activate the youth vote than it was actually trying to do anything. And I'm such a strong believer in this idea that, you know, as we look at racist paternalism, we also have to look at ageist paternalism and how like a lot of these young people, because, you know, like I'm... Um, I'm a millennial, but like looking at Gen Z, like they have grown up in such a diametrically different world. Like I grew up kind of in this information age, like having always having internet access in my house, which again can follow along like classist lines. Um, but looking at how um, these young people grew up, there's always been a war going on, um, seeing um, mass shootings, seeing, you know, conversations about politics happening in the media, seeing like a new accessibility level, like seeing that, you know, uh, 
AOC posted like a super apt video on her like Instagram story where she calls herself like a bad bitch. Like this is a different time. And I think it's really like cherishing that moment, but also understanding the fact that there's young people who uh, have not even finished, you know, middle school who are talking on TikTok in like their 30 second um, conversations about voter disenfranchisement. They're talking about like overbilling and how to like register your family for health insurance. The kids know what they're doing. It's about, I think a lot of times getting out of their way and making sure that you're supporting them. It's something that, um, Ella Baker absolutely believed in this idea that, okay, if we're going to have SNCC, we're going to make sure that the adults are there to support, but only uh, at the request of the young people. So it's kind of a shift that needs to happen. It's about looking at decentralized leadership when it comes to like grassroots organizations, but also really empowering young people and not talking down to them. Because that can be so disempowering. Like psychological studies show it when you come at a kid, um, and that's anybody who's younger than me, like I, I'm 26, so everybody younger than me is a kid. Um, but if you come to somebody and you're saying like, hey, this is what you're doing wrong, you're disempowering them because you don't honestly know. If you haven't spoken to that kid yet, you don't know what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong. If you're starting your ad by saying, so many young people don't care to vote instead of like, hey, how can we help? You know, like it's a difference. So I'm seeing folks like, you know, before this dystopian novel, as you said, Kimberly, um, seeing like rappers like Chance the Rapper have voting registration, um, having folks like check your voter registration just as you're like moshing and chilling in the crowd. Like that's such an empowering and important part. And there's this idea that we have to return to civic life it needs to be stated at a fundamental level that civil, civic life did not include people who look like anybody on this talk. That civic life was extremely segregated. And by segregated, I mean black people didn't have anything and white people were able to you know, be involved in public affairs. And in fact, a fundamental tenet of white supremacy is access to public life and public affairs. And so there's this idea that um, as we deconstruct white supremacy that, oh no, we can't let these uneducated people come into this space. They'll ruin everything. Well, y'all have done a terrible job trying to maintain it in your way. So let's reimagine the system. But as far as like activating young people and m pushing them and stuff, like they really know what they need, especially at a time where they've had access to information that I had to go through an encyclopedia series to find. And it was outdated by the time I got to it. They can find things up to the moment. They're tuned in. Um, it's really about being there as a resource that's what I try to do but it's also like one of those things is I've seen young people here in San Marino even like making sure that the school is registered as a voting as a place to vote, register to vote um, to fill out forms to find forms to learn how to fill out forms with volunteer students during the lunch hour or after school and then also being a voting location which might look different because of the pandemic but these things are important and I think young people should just be, uh, you know, encouraged to remember that, especially if you're going to a public school, we can't just look at a, a syllabus or what you're learning as it being top down, even though so often it is because we are teaching to a test. But the fact is you are a constituent of that small school. And if we look at a school like a government and if we understand that bylaws and constitutions should be made, made by the people, then think of your teachers and think of your administrators as leaders in government and really understand the fact that you can help to create this constitution, the syllabus, and be in charge or be a fundamental part of what you end up learning. So you are part of the solution. It's really just about, like I said, getting rid of that limitations of imagination and start to learn from other kids. But this is already happening. Not, nothing that I'm saying is news to these young people. Yeah, for sure. Um, Kimberly, you had mentioned word of mouth and the power of that, right? Like sort of being in person, being on the ground. And then Blair, you're saying the power of technology, the power of social media, the power of pop culture. And I think those two, we both need them. Um, but as Kimberly was saying, they need to be concise. They need to be accurate. And I think, Blair, like you're saying, Gen Z is definitely, you know, unafraid to really kind of dig, research, and find information and educate themselves. So that's super powerful. Um, so Kimberly, you talked a little bit about... Um, how you face, you know, voter oppression. Um, but kind of, I kind of want to dive into that a little more. Like, how have you all um, personally uh, faced any type of uh, barriers when it came to voting? Yeah, so I definitely, like, I checked everything to make sure that, like, I, my name should have been on the roll, that my vote should have been counted. And I did everything correct. Everything was above. And here's the interesting part. One of my girlfriends who um, is Asian American, she, we did early voting. And so she came and picked me up and we went in my neighborhood, which is a predominantly black neighborhood. And we voted together and both of us were missing our vote. Or both of our votes were missing when we kept checking, um, when we kept checking online. She did a mail-in of her husband 
and her when she did a mail-in of her mother and her husband had gone to do early voting in their neighborhood which was a predominantly white neighborhood his vote was fine her mother's vote was fine so then together she and i are like hmm interesting so we went down to we we called and we complained and we did all this stuff and we got a phone call from the Georgia Dim saying, hey, we're getting a lot of these phone calls. We got a lot of them from the district in which this happened to you. And we're putting together a class action suit. Can you come down and fill out this paperwork so that and sign this affidavit and be a part of this class action lawsuit? And we were like, we can't get down there quick enough. We wish we had wings. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so you know, we started to fight, fight it that way. But also one of the things that I did was I became like, like William Tell, I was like running through the town. I was on my social media. Anybody who would ask, like if someone didn't ask, I would say, I know you didn't ask, but um, <laughs> I started talking about it because what it did was it launched other people to go, let me check my vote. Oh, let me let me call the voter board myself and make sure that I'm okay. Oh, that happened to you? Let me Let me see. And what happened was not just myself, but many other people who were involved were doing the same thing. And so what happened is it started this wave and tons of people were going, me too, me too, me too, me too. And next thing you know, there's there's probably like 30,000 people named in this lawsuit, which is mm -hmm. why we feel confident that you know we may have a good look because it's like, this happened to this many people in the state at a time in which our now governor was secretary of state. I don't even know how that's legal that you can run for governor and be the secretary, be over the vote which is, you know, fascinating information. Um, but because of that now, I really have dug deep into making sure that people understand the vote and understand lobbying and understand showing up for city meetings and understand all of the laws that are related to that. I just did an IG Live recently with um, civil rights attorney, attorney um, Gerald Griggs, who's also a vice president of our Georgia branch of the NAACP. And I had him go through all the amendments and all the voting laws on IG Live and allowed people to ask questions and dig in and get the information that they needed. Because even though we are asking people to do actionable items and we should. I give people actionable items on my IG page every Tuesday. Um, and, and if they ask me questions about them, I give them snarky answers. Like, I don't know, what do you think? Because this is not a space for me to help you. This is a space for you to do the research. Um, mm -hmm. But one of the things that also is key and essential to all of this is the passing of information amongst us. Like we mm -hmm. all have to pass information amongst us. And so with me having my own poor experience and having my vote suppressed, what I realized is if no one had told me that I could call and check on my vote, I wouldn't have even known. So that piece of information was so critical and essential to all of us who are part of this, this lawsuit, just someone telling us you know you can check and you can call the voter registration board and check and see if your vote was counted. And you're like, no, I didn't know that information. And all of us getting just that piece of information has put us in the position we're in now. So when it comes to fighting anything, just don't assume that people know, because guess what? None of us know everything. There's not one person on this earth who knows everything. You can be the most educated person in the world. You can have 65 PhDs have spent your life going to school, and there's still going to be so much that you don't know. And so how we assist each other in fighting voter suppression and fighting all of this is to continue to talk about it in, a, in an educational way, not talking out of the side of our necks, because I say all the time, I'm, I'm no longer in a heart fight. I gave up the heart fight a long time ago. I'm now realizing that we are in a serious head fight. And so you have to be heady and thoughtful and organized and, and synchronized and, and how we're going about this fight. But that's part of it is that when we have, you know, good information, then, you know, got, you know, rest in peace, John Lewis, then it's time for us to get in good trouble. And part of that good trouble is going to be the sharing of information. Amen. Preach. Blair, do you want to add I have really, <laughs> I honestly don't have anything to add. That was exemplary as always. Um, I think that it's, it's so like in my own personal experience, like going from being able to like do absentee ballots to like then having to fight to be able to do absentee ballots once I was registered, uh, once I did get my Louisiana license, moving up to DC and then suddenly like 
as soon as I registered to vote in DC, my older sister, like, you just threw your vote away because, they, you know, DC doesn't have statehood. And so that looks different when you ter- in terms of representation and what that means. And so it was really interesting um, for me to see kind of how it shifts even within systems that are all supposed to be working perfectly. But as, as you were talking, Kimberly, it made me think about, you know, the people who are saying things like go vote, register to vote, et cetera, but then don't give their employees time off. And this actually happened to me where I was late to work. And because, you know, my boss, who was a white woman, she could easily vote in her area of New York because her area of New York wanted to make sure that everybody was able to vote. My area of New York, no, we had to go up, you know, like a bunch of different rickety stairs, use the elevator that was questionable. Um, You know, this thinking, you know, presently how that's going to work on election day, there's just no way to socially distance uh, in places where public housing is then used, well, one where public housing is, and then also where public housing is used for uh, voter, uh, for voting and uh, for voter engagement. Why? Because public housing, as it was created in the United States, especially in New York City, wasn't created for people to thrive and to be, for, to be able to live or to be able to access public space. It was to hide people away who are living in poverty. It's a very capitalist construction um, that is also overlaid with, again, paternalism, surprise, and white supremacy. Um, mm-hmm. And so I was thinking about uh, that and how, you know, I had to wait because there are people who uh, they didn't have enough forms in Spanish. They didn't have enough forms and in, in adequate information. Then they had to fire one person and redo a lot of the votes because she was coaching people in her, like, you know, hopes to educate folks. She's accidentally telling people how to vote. Um, and so how all these differences come together. And then I get into the office. Blair, you're late. Uh, okay, well, I was voting. Like, I, my whole job is to vote. Is to, what? And so, and, but, but she was like, well, it took me five minutes and I got on the train. And I was like, well, you live in a white neighborhood. Um, I only worked there for six months. You can see where on LinkedIn, so I'm not going to drop names, but you'll be able to deduce. <laughs> um, and it was just such a difference. Like, and then I contrast that with my time working at Planned Parenthood, where, you know, you had ample time. If there was something locally happening, because uh, I worked at Planned Parenthood at the national level, like, as we talked to our affiliates, if it was an election, election day, you might have been treating it like a paid holiday, you might have been on call for that day, but you had the time to do it. And it's really the difference between organizations that walk the walk and talk the talk, as far as like, you know, supporting voter initiatives, but also like look at their real life and people who are interested in not having who are not interested in having an analysis, but claim to be doing the work or to be doing all of the work. Like, it's just so duplicitous. Um, I think the duplicitousness impression, because on the one hand, you have somebody saying something, and that's Sounds good, but like Kim really said, they're talking out the side of their neck and they're full of shit. Drops mic, basically. <laughs> um, so with the um, intersection of technology and social media, how do the both of you see um, spreading you know, information about voting? Um, how do you see that sort of changing in the future? We kind of touched on it a little bit, but. I think, I think it's like utilizing technology for specifically for this moment, this amazing magical moment that we're having right now makes Mm -hmm. all the sense in the world. Like I say it all the time jokingly, but it's true. It's like, imagine if Martin Luther King had Facebook, like what a, what a difference it would have been in terms of getting the message across. I mean, they managed to put together the bus boycott, you know, for over a year, for well over a year with just word of mouth and commitment from people and almost put the bus company out of business, which is why they had to come up with, you know, better behavior. It wasn't because they had a change of heart and were so nice. It took them over a year to have that change of heart. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that's what you're seeing now with a with a lot of these these companies and, and corporations that now all of a sudden have a new tune. Like, Angel Mama, you've known that was racist for a century now. Don't pretend like now all of a sudden you've had some wide awakening and you know that that woman on that box is insulting and, and difficult for us to look at. Um, and so, but I think what you're seeing is because of technology, we really do live in a global economy we really do live in a global understanding. And so it's like, you know, someone can post a video of George Floyd and the world sees it. That was not the case, not even for Rodney King, not even for, you know, definitely not for what was going on in the civil rights era. We can even go further back, not for what was going on during, you know, the shifts in reconstruction. Like this has, this has been a, game changer and if we utilize it properly which i think to a certain degree we have right 
we utilize in property, what happens is you don't just get the people on the block on your side. We have the world walking and marching right now. Um, I, I get phone calls every day from places like Australia. And I had, a, I had a phone call the other day from Ghent, Belgium. And, you know, I'm talking to people in South Africa and London. And um, I did a Zoom call with all the Black members of Parliament this week. And so we have an opportunity through technology to have a global conversation, but also more importantly, to get global allies. Um, and global accomplices in this fight that we're in. And so if we're strategic, even about that, I love Sonia Renee Ta Taylor. Like I always jokingly tell her that like, you know, I need her consent, but she's my girlfriend. Um, and one of the things that she and I talk about all the time is her buyback black debt program that she has, um, where she basically is like, look, if y'all not going to give us reparations, then you have to understand the economic the disparagement that has happened to black people and how you have participated participated in and how you have benefited from it. So if you're really sorry, don't don't Venmo me $50. I'm going to post some black people that have some debt that needs to be purchased and you need to purchase it. And so she's had people like pay off people's student loans and credit card debt and, and all of this stuff through her buyback black debt program. But she and I were talking about it and she, it doesn't just come from the US. She gets it from people in London. She gets it from people in Germany. She gets it from all of these people who know that they have, you know, an obligation um to do some work it's you know it's like a it's like a deadbeat dad like if he finally shows up with a cookie you don't say like oh my god it's, it's so brilliant you've shown up with the cookie now that the child is eight and i've been tending to the child all my long like i'm not giving you guys any cookies for this behavior that you're doing right now you this is be you did this this is your mess to clean up you're cleaning it up you don't i don't clap my hands and say you look at you because you're cleaning up your mess now and you're not even cleaning up all the way right just yet so you still definitely don't deserve a cookie we'll see the jury's still out we'll see what happens yeah. um it's, it's still a hot mess <laughs> yeah it's still a total total and complete hot mess but i went around the bend and back again to say that you know technology and the utilization of technology is a serious part in that because even with what you're seeing with these companies they're not just reacting because we're saying something because we've been we've been saying stuff since 2014 with Mike Brown we've been saying something since Trayvon Martin we've been saying something since Rodney King we've been saying something since you know the the sharecroppers that were killed in 1929 like what is happening is the fear is there because due to technology, due to our global imprint, the world is looking and going, are you okay? No, you're not okay? Cancel. Are you all right? Oh no, you ain't all right, Nabisco. Canceled. And so mm -hmm. the fear of that, the, the economic impact that technology has allowed this global conversation to have is what's going to make the difference. So I think we need to keep pushing the button and pushing the gas on that. Absolutely. And I think it cannot be understated how like fundamental this has been, even when like looking at my own career trajectory, I would not have published any books if it were not for technology. Um, I would not have like, there's just so many things like, would I even have been able to like figure out that LSU's history program was the best one for me? Would I even have finished the history program? Like who knows? And it, it's just, it cannot be understated because and it's also not new. Um, Feminista Jones talks about how, you know, Twitter and Black Twitter directly connects to this idea of having so many diasporic Black peoples and African peoples and how we created communication mechanisms even during enslavement when we literally did not speak the same languages as each other. Why? Because oppressors specifically divided us so that way we would be disoriented and unable to organize effectively, but we did it anyway. And there were revolts and there were, uh, you know, taking over of, of enslavement ships and turning them back around and really trying to disrupt the system, not always um, to, you know, a final win, but the win is sometimes the fact that people mobilize and move forward. And so this is a continuation. I see folks saying like, you can't have something be aesthetic and it be black power. Excuse me, black power. Let's talk about the Black Panther Party and how they didn't just show up in turtlenecks and afros that were perfectly symmetrical because they woke up that way. It was about using imagery and about using the current technology, which for them was having their own newspaper, having the 10 point program, um, having, you know, theories created by Bobby Seale and Huey Newton to then turn black vocalization, black beauty, the unbridled black hair of the natural throw, and then turning that into a message. So people talk about this is performative, this is performative. Now performative means shallow, but you can have a performance, have a demonstration, and still have that be effective. That can happen on social media, that can happen online. We are human beings. We love a story, uh, like from a 
psychological standpoint, again, we love a story. We love uh, a narrative. We also love imagery. And that all feeds into our hearts and minds. But like Kimberly just said, it's not a hearts and minds conversation anymore. It's about using these things for the purpose of, un of helping people to critically think and connect dots. Um, I'll have a podcast episode coming up soon where I looked at the shark attacks that happened in 1916 and connecting to them to the fact that the United States government spent the equivalent of $120,000 to investigate three shark attacks than any of the 492 instances of lynchings that happened over Woodrow Wilson's presidency, even though he was the guy who organized a cabinet meeting the day, the Monday, <clears throat> the Monday after the shark attacks. So when we look at technology, we have to also look at, like, put it in context. So we have to put in context the fact that not everybody all over the world has internet access. We have to look at the fact that um, there's a privilege conversation. Why we have some of the most privileged and economically privileged voices on social media is because they have the access to the technology. They have internet connections. If you can't get on the internet or because you can't pay your phone bill, you can't tweet, we don't get to hear your voice. So it's not just this assumption that this is democratized or it's all equal now. It's about also overlaying the current state with the still existing systems of oppression that then influence whose voice is heard and when and how and how frequently. And that also comes down to looking at folks like, um, you know, the safety teams and whose Twitter accounts are taken down and whose aren't the president. You know, it's, it's really looking at these power dynamics and not looking at the vehicles through which we are telling stories and we are, are exchanging information, whether that's through TikTok or Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, WeChat, whatever but understanding that those are not neutral vehicles, that those are also actors in the system, and those often, more often than not, uh, work to the detriment of black women, even though black women tend to be the ones who are creating those spaces and making them trendy and fun and interesting, which you can learn more about with Feminista Jones' book, Reclaiming Our Space, highly recommend. Um, but it's understanding the fact that those directly influence whiteness and so we can again use these systems to our advantage consult with these companies i've done my fair share of conversations with uh you know safety teams at instagram and twitter but more than that it's making sure you know there's a conversation we need our own stuff we cannot like we have to emphasize the fact that black people oppressed people marginalized people we are infinitely creative in using a system that was created to inherently oppress us for our advantage so that needs to be said and so again it's just for the folks who aren't marginalized to understand that these aren't neutral players. Nothing is neutral. Everything is political. Everything has an end goal and it falls along the lines of oppression and privilege every day. You know, like looking at the clothes that you're wearing on your back, you have to look at the supply chain. You might just think, oh, this is just a shirt. No, this shirt is also political because somebody made this shirt. This uh, materials were sourced from somewhere that's going to follow along economic lines. And that's why when I see somebody saying, oh, I'm doing a fundraiser, I'm speaking up. I made these T-shirts for Black Lives Matter. It's like, yeah, congrats, though. Those T-shirts were made in a sweatshop and those sweatshop workers are black and brown and Asian people. Those are BIPOC folks who you're now oppressing under the guise of raising money when you could have just wrote a check and saved your time. Mm. 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 Let that sit. Let that resonate for a little bit. Like that is some deep, deep, deep. And I think what we're talking about doing your research like really do your research and really connect the dots, you know? Um, we dropped a lot of gems here today, but what message would you all like to leave behind to the students? Um, the one thing that I would just say to the, to the students is like, get a plan, set a plan. You don't have to be all things to all people. You don't have to pick up all the fights. There are too many fights. There are so many fights. Um, but there's somebody out there in the world working on each one. Find the thing that you are passionate about. Find the thing that speaks to you. Don't, um, one of my mentors, um, Yanajaha Lone Wolf, who is, she's like amazing because she is half black, half Lakota. And so she's like in the Native American fight and she is in the black fight and she's in the women's fight and she's like in all these spaces. And sometimes I'm like, yo, take a nap. Just you just take a nap. <laughs> um, but one of the things that she talks to me about and how she balances being in three full on battles um, all the time is that she's like, I take my ego out of the things that I choose to do. And there are times when people are calling me and saying, hey, we're going to be in this space and we wanted you to come. And she'll say, no, she's learned to say no, thank you. I'll pass. And she's like, because I've learned that ego will make me want to go so that I, 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 cause it's about the me has a, have a presence 
in this moment that is deemed an important moment, instead of saying, this thing is calling to me, I need to do, spirit is telling me I need to do something about this. I feel a passion for this thing and I need to go. And she's like, when I don't feel that, you know, after 20 years of, of, of being a warrior, she's like, when I don't feel that about something, I say no. And I let the people who are going to be consistent with it because they have a passion for it, take that fight on. And she's like, and so that's, the thing that I say to young people, if you are passionate about literature and you think, hey, the textbooks in schools are incorrect and I'm, I'm going to form a commission that's going to talk to all those people in Texas and get the textbooks changed, then you need to like dig in your heels on that and do that thing and get that thing done. Don't feel the need to meet me in Kentucky to march for Breonna Taylor. Don't feel the need to be down at Standing Rock and fight for the, war, for the water. Like, don't feel the need you know, to come to Atlanta and fight for Rayshard Brooks. Don't feel the need to have to, um, you know, wave your flag for something else that is not your passion when you can be productive digging in and getting those textbooks changed, which would make a world of difference and I'm, and I'm saying that because we all feel a sense of it, right? Like, oh my God, there's so many things. And like, I, I, I want to be helpful. So I want to do my piece on all the things and all of the callings. And it's like, you don't have to, my love. You just have to be productive. And you're super productive if you get the one dope thing done. And I'm going to receive that as a direct message to me personally. Because sometimes that's what you need to do. Um, no, because sometimes you're put in places and spaces. Like, I made the joke with my friend that God works through Instagram, too. You know, I'm mm -hmm. a religious woman. I'm a woman of faith. And, uh, you know, if you believe in God, then oftentimes you also believe that God works in mysterious ways. And sometimes those ways aren't mysterious. Sometimes those ways are very tangible. Sometimes mm -hmm. things are coincidence. Sometimes, especially when it comes to blessings, they aren't because they're very much on purpose. Um, and, you know, what you said resonates so much with me because I'm coming to peace with the fact that, you know, I used to be a grassroots organizer. I was arrested in 2016 uh, in the Baton Rouge protests. We are still suing Baton Rouge, the city of Baton Rouge. Um, and it's one of those things where I thought that I could do it. You know, like I, I know in my heart that it's emotional and it's traumatic for me to go back into spaces that are, you know, crowds that are protests just because the energy reminds me of going back to that place. That's, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. But in my infinite wisdom, you know, I was like, okay, well, let me go down to the protest. It'll be fun. It'll be safe. And as soon as I got there, I started hyperventilating. I started crying. I could not be present in that moment. I was there, but I was not present. And mm -hmm. it was, you know, kind of a confirmation of this change that I made in myself where I no longer do grassroots activism. I'm retired. But what I do now so much is history, being a historian, doing history telling, making sure that people can connect dots and put things in context. Because who else is making the connection between shark attacks and lynchings? And it's so important. Like there's more nostalgia so and more empathy and more stories made for three shark attacks than there are for any of the victims that were killed during that time period by lynching, by murderous mobs. And there's more fear in American culture of sharks than there are of white supremacists by other white people, even though white people have killed more people than sharks have killed in the same time period. So mm -hmm. there's so many different things where I feel like I can be truly productive. So does so, so much. You can't be everything to everyone. You have to specialize and do what you do and do it well. And it's something that Dr. Terry Roberts, who was one of Little Rock Nine, told me, you know, back when I was doing college activism, but it wasn't resonating with me. It was, I was hearing it, but I wasn't listening. And so I cannot emphasize that enough. It's the fact that, you know, you do what you do well, and let the other things fall by the wayside because there are other people who do that well. And the last thing you want to do is unnecessarily take up space or be harmful or be unproductive or be harmful to yourself because we want to live in the world that we are trying to create together. I'm not willing to be a martyr. I want to live in this better world. I want to make sure that we make it to that better world. I'm so grateful that uh, Congressman John Lewis and C.T. Vivian were able to see this world. But it shouldn't be something that we cherish that they were able to become elders, but it is because so many of their contemporaries were assassinated and lives were extinguished. Um, and so many people whose names you will never know because of violence and how their lives, you know, maybe they would have had more time with us if it were not for the systemic racism that they experienced. So these are important things to consider. I want to live in the world that I'm working to create. Um, and that's something that I would want to leave students with one last tidbit, some lanyards, some little extra, um, with my Louisiana French, is that you can't change everybody. The thing that I get a lot with students and young people coming to me is that my friends are problematic in this group chat. What do I do, Blair? Let me tell you that I would rather be alone than in the company of oppressors. And sometimes 
when you're a young person, learning to become comfortable with yourself and with your loneliness and with being by yourself and also knowing that being lonely and being by yourself are not the same things because you can be lonely in a crowd of people that really mm -hmm. holding fast to your values and your integrity and not compromising that for anyone, you'll win in the end. And I'll tell you why, because I didn't change anything about myself growing up. Yes, I changed as a person, but I never had to fundamentally change who I was. And now everybody wants to hang out with me, people who bullied me by my books. So just remember the fact that you don't have to change who you are. When, you, when I mean we want to live in that world, that means you right now. It doesn't mean you have to transform or change who you are fundamentally or change your values or change what you hold sacred, as long as it's not problematic and white supremacist, in order to be in that better world. Yeah, so definitely focus on one thing and have intention, right? I think that's mm -hmm. the power of intention is so important, um, especially nowadays. Um, so where can, uh, where can people follow you all? Where can they connect with you? And if there's anything um, coming up, uh, for either of you, please feel free to share. Um, people can find me if you if you go to my website, which is www.kimjoneswrites.com. That's rights, W-R-I-T-E-S, because some people think it's like rights, um, but it's, it's <laughs> rights. Um, <laughs> uh, if you go to kimjoneswrites.com, you can find everything me there. So you can find all my social media accounts. You can find um, my book. You can find my upcoming events. All of that stuff is there. I'm super excited because sometimes um, I think people don't realize that I'm also a filmmaker. So people know my novels, they know my social justice work, but I'm also a filmmaker. Um, and one of the things that I'm super excited about is my novel, I'm Not Dying With You Tonight, is being made into a film. So I just got the second draft on the script, which I have to read and give notes on today. Um, clap it up, clap it up. Yes, yeah. congrats. Thank you. I'm like <laughs> super excited about that. And, and so that film will be coming probably to some digital platform. Um, we've been talking to our distributor and we think that's gonna be best to go digital in the world in which we currently live. Um, but it'll be coming to a digital platform next year. So that's that's the one thing I want people to look out for is I'm not dying with you tonight, the movie. That, oh, well, awesome. I'm excited for that. Um, for <laughs> yes. myself, I'm working really heavy on this podcast. Um, I follow the legacy of Miss Sadie Roberts Joseph, whose life was taken last year. And she's the reason why I'm a historian. And she really impressed upon me the idea of being a public historian, uh, which is not hiding away in the archives, but making plain the history that people have lived. You shouldn't have to pay to find out the truth about your ancestors, yet that's the case for so many different people. Um, so I'm doing that through America Did What, which is a podcast hosted by myself and my friend and actual cousin, Kate Robards. She looks lily white. I do not. Yet we are cousins because of the legacy of American slavery. Um, and so it's been really interesting how we are these long lost relatives and how we've come together. So every episode we uh, comes out every two weeks, we discuss in a radio play format, um, things that you might not connect. Like we talk about the GI Bill and redlining and the truth and lies about that. Um, but the one that I'm really excited about is the shark attacks one, which is episode three. Um, and we're working on episode four right now, which is about, <clears throat> which is about the Tuskegee syphilis atrocities, um, which mm -hmm. I refuse to call an experiment. It was an atrocity and how mm -hmm. white paternalism still is baked into how we tell these stories. Cause we look at these, uh, you know, studies that will talk about how this was a racist study that shouldn't have happened but they sure were ungrateful and should have been thankful like no so i really want to change the way history is told um i want to empower people to engage with history and make it easier to do so and so i'll be doing that in various ways you can connect with me i answer well i read all my instagram dms i answer the ones that are worth answering but i do ask you to keep your inquiry to two to three sentences because by the time i look at it my ritalin will have worn off and it will be a struggle <laughs> so you know just i think this is a really important time. We can't unlive this past month, this past year, uh, where there's been this groundswell of interest in anti-racism. We can't go backwards. But folks like me, folks like Kimberly, you, Courtney, we're not going to be the ones to let the moment down. It's going to be the folks who decide to lose interest because they can. Yeah. Right. They have the privilege to lose interest. Right. Um, you, myself, and you know, us here, we don't, you know, we have to, we're just a part of that. It's, it's a part of our uh, legacy, you know? Um, and so, yeah, like, I want to say just personally, thank you both so much. Um, I see you, I hear you. Um, I'm hoping that the people who've seen our panel today have seen you all and have heard you and have really received the information and are inspired and uh, motivated to really make change. Um, it's going to be, 
essential um, come November. Uh, so that's going to be very, very important um, for us to to really continue the work, continue engaging, continue having a discourse um, and, and not giving up, you know, no matter what. Um, if we want to make change, we have to be the change, right? So um, I want to thank um, the Andrew Goodman Foundation for, you know, although we are in a pandemic, they have found a way uh, for uh, the weekend to happen, um, regardless of us all sort of still being in quarantine and, and isolated and, and all over the U.S. Um, but it, it's really nice for us to really kind of all come together and have community. So uh, we're hoping that you are watching, we're able to take something from our panel today. Um, and, you know, we are here with you all. We're fighting, you know, please make sure that you support and, and have intention and just do the right thing. All right, thank you all so much for joining us, Kimberly. It's been a blessing being yeah. in your presence. Thank you so much for participating. Um, and Blair, uh, it was great chatting with you too. So everyone have a great rest of the day. Bye. Thank you, Courtney, you're a great moderator. Oh, thank you. Bye. <laughs>